Welcome to another by ThoughtWorks. And it's been a year of these. Goodness me. A year ago, this was a very tense moment for us. We hadn't really done it before. We weren't sure how it would work. And now look, goodness, the things that the last year has thrown at us. And one of those has been what by ThoughtWorks could become when it's on the internet. And it's instead of being an in-person thing, able to access a global audience is such a big benefit. Today, guiding the evolution of data mesh with fitness functions. That's pretty technical, but uh, well, you're here, so you're interested in that, and I know it. Dave Coles, I've worked with ever since I joined ThoughtWorks, which is not that long ago. Director of Data and Artificial Intelligence Practice, um, computer scientist, engineer, innovator, data person now all around, um, but probably one of the most down-to-earth data scientists, data engineers, you'll possibly hope to meet. So I'm um, always great. Dave is wonderful at explaining things in, in simple language. Jamak Dilgani joining us from America, which is in the time zone of uh, it's late in or it's early in the evening where she is. Teacher, thinker, author, director of emerging technologies for ThoughtWorks, which is, is very cool. I know she has her favorite technologies. Also an incredible inventor and uh, holder of several patents, um, inventor of the whole real concept of data mesh, which is I know what a lot of people are, are here for today, has been so generous with their time talking about that and, and spreading the good word about data mesh over time. Also an all round brilliant human being. So today, I, what I my take on today, having had a little insight, is it's really about the consequences of the work you all do in the world of data and, and getting off on the right foot for the next decade. So I've done my homework for this webinar. A couple of books I was given as homework. One was uh, learning about algorithms. So I was talking about before a book called Once Upon an Algorithm. That's my first recommendation for the day. Martin Erwig's book about for people like me, helping you explain what algorithms can and can't be, full of interesting characters and storytelling. The other is a very up-to-the-minute book, which has got an incredibly boring title, which is Improving Data Warehouse and Business Information Quality Methods for Reducing Costs and Increasing Profits by someone called Larry P. English, talking about the information quality crisis, the high costs of low-quality data, about 20% of our data being invalid that we've stored, 30% of our data containing errors, an incredibly up-to-the-minute book until I realized it was written in 1999. So what have we been doing since those worlds of data warehouses, data lakes, all those kind of things? It's just the basics, collecting, connecting, correcting data. Um, what happens now in 2020 when we take that same data quality issue and data governance issue and pipe it into things with consequence? Well, we end up with cars in Texas, crashed by the side of the road in flames. We end up with, in Australia, some pretty terrible social impacts of programs around collecting debts from people who are looked after by us, our government. So social justice, medicine, all sorts of fields are now deeply dependent on governance and quality of data. And so it's a real thrill to me to have two experts who are thinking about that and are writing about that and they're thinking about the how and how do I start? If I go back to once upon an algorithm, it's the Holmes and Watson of this problem um, who are two characters used to explain algorithms and it's perhaps the Hansel and Gretel of algorithms. Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm just gonna hand right over to you to welcome. Thank you so much for your time today. Let's get going. Thank you very much, Nigel, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as, as Nigel said, it is uh, quite a specialised topic, um, but we do hope that you're here because you're interested, and uh, we hope that we can uh, make this an elementary uh, presentation uh, of, of the topic. Uh, well, I'd like to start by unpacking the title to, uh, to talk a little bit more about why we chose to talk about guiding the evolution of data mesh with fitness functions today. So, so what does this all mean? Uh, there's a few bits in the title. Um, the easy bit is we're talking about implementing data mesh architecture um, that we presume you uh, you all have some interest in, uh, where we're looking at analytical data being distributed to domains aligned in the same way as operational services. Also in the title, we're talking about evolutionary architecture, 
Uh, we're talking about supporting a transformation, which is technical, but also organizational in nature. Uh, and we're supporting it in a way that uh, the desirable properties of the architecture improve over time or can be preserved through that change. Uh, and how, how we preserve or guide that change is by using the notion of fitness functions. And fitness functions uh, are an algorithm, you might say, that tell us how well the architecture is meeting our objectives. And so that's, uh, that, that's how the title came to be. And, and why is that title important? Well, we think fitness functions are great because they give us an outside in perspective. Uh, we can draw a boundary around part of a system that we're interested in. It could be a particular data product, a group of data products. It could be the platform that supports them. It could be how teams are organized. It could be the whole analytic data landscape for the enterprise. Uh, and we can draw that boundary and we can ask how well uh, is this meeting our objectives with fitness functions uh, from an outside in perspective without necessarily knowing all the details of uh, what's implemented under the uh, behind the scenes there. Also discussing fitness functions early in the development of an architecture is very valuable for aligning expectations and prioritizing development efforts. Uh, being able to talk about trade-offs with some level of quantification and, and making success explicit. So even before we can measure anything, talking about how we're going to measure it is really a, an effective design technique. And, and with fitness functions from the outside in view, wider stakeholders have a basis for understanding the objectives of data mesh uh, and how well we are meeting them, again, without necessarily knowing how things are implemented. So, so why did I suggest we should talk to Jamak about this? Jamak and I have a great distributed collaboration across the Pacific. Um, and I had uh, mentioned to Jamak that here in Australia, we have conversations with organizations about data mesh, which go many ways, but there are some common threads through those conversations. How will it be different? Um, how will we know if it's working? Uh, and, and where should we start? And to answer these questions, we need to be able to get a read on the state of the world uh, and measurement and using fitness functions to do that allows us to do that. As I said, at first pass, we can establish whether we're talking about the same type of things, uh, you know, we, we would propose measuring it in the same way. Uh, and at second pass, then we can actually get a little bit more detailed about how close we are to meeting our objectives. Yeah, I got, I got really excited when um, David reached out to me and said, let's, let's talk about fitness functions and data mesh because, uh, you know, data mesh is a transformation and it's a transformation of your architecture, it's a transformation of your organizational structure, your culture, uh, and it takes time to create it. So you need to have a way to measure, are we going to the right direction or not? And it, it, we have a lot of talks that go into the details of what is data mesh and how to build it. And it was... I think it's a nice complimentary kind of conversation to say, well, how do we actually know we are heading to the right direction? And so, uh, so data mesh um, uh, is, uh, as uh, you we assume you're aware, it's a, a, a new architectural paradigm. Um, and we see it as an opportunity to, to shed the legacy of centralized analytical data. Um, this does create, it strives to create efficiencies, but at the same time, it introduces organizational barriers to trust, safe innovation, uh, and capability development at scale. Um, you know, we see in our, our work across the technology landscape in, in digital product teams, otherwise largely self-sufficient, uh, when they have a need to supply or request data from a central team or central environment, uh, we know that uh, this introduces a lot of friction into the process. Uh, and even simple tasks take orders of magnitude longer when you start to involve multiple teams. Uh, once upon a time, the impact of this was, was smaller when analytics uh, was just about reporting. Uh, but as Nigel says, now analytics has real world consequences uh, when it's folded back into product features and folded back into operational decision making. And this friction may be untenable if we want to deliver data driven value at scale. And so the coherent architectural paradigm that data mesh presents is uh, oriented primarily around the idea of autonomous domain oriented data products. Uh, and so you'll see domain ownership and data as a product as, as two principles there. Uh, and the interlocking and supporting principles of self-serve platform and federated computational governance that support those. Uh, 
support the alignment of autonomous units in data mesh. And so these are the principles that we'll talk through today. Um, and under each of these principles, we'll elaborate on, on the objectives uh, that, those, uh, that are driving those principles. And under those objectives, we'll talk about how you might measure that uh, to guide uh, and uh, to guide your transformation. So uh, I think for, for, sharp, for those with sharp eyes, you might have already noticed that the, the concept of federated computational governance uh, is actually quite close to fitness functions in many ways. If you can uh, have a computational view of, of how well your governance is working, uh, that's quite close to fitness functions. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll present a wider range of ideas today across the other principles. Um, and uh, while it's not the, uh, while we don't think it's the end word in the conversation, uh, it's nice to start the conversation on, on fitness functions and hopefully you'll find something of interest uh, that matters to your organization. So we have picked quite, picked a, quite a wordy title, fitness functions. Uh, so I wanted to just give a bit of a reference where it came from, what does it mean before diving in. So fitness functions is a, a concept in evolutionary computing, which was adopted by our colleagues, Neil Ford, Rebecca Parsons, and Pat Kwa in their books, Building Evolutionary Architecture, as a way of essentially uh, guiding, building an architecture uh, that goes through transformation. So what is an evolutionary architecture? Well, data mission is an example of an evolutionary architecture. Um, the evolutionary architecture has three characteristics. You can go to the next slide. And we have a bit of a delay, so I may wanna move a little bit faster. Uh, evolutionary architecture has three characteristics. Well, it's an architecture that goes through incremental changes uh, and it goes through incremental changes through multiple dimensions, but we're using some sort of a guide to know, uh, to really guide our changes of our architecture. So in this example, for example, you know, we have data mesh, one of the pillars is data as a product. You probably have data sets as assets right now, and <clears throat> you want to, through incremental changes, move to this world of data as a product and building these data products, which are a new concept. Uh, we have the concept of self-serve, you know, infrastructure. So our infrastructure needs to move from being self-serve utility layer to more advanced experience planes where we go to, through the details of that. So you, you will see this evolutionary change through multiple dimensions. So what you would need some way of knowing if these dimensions are kind of moving to the right directions. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, technique that you can use is, is the guide is called a fitness function. So it's a function. Uh, it has an uh, that you know it gives you a value at the end when you run it, and the the value of that function, the return end of that function, indicates whether your your solutions is moving towards its target state or is moving away from it. Uh, I highly recommend looking at the book because they have you know numerous examples of different categories of these functions and how you write them. They could be as simple as a unit test that you embed into your data products to make sure that uh, they do what they need to do or the data that they're processing, they're generating has the right integrity or they could be as sophisticated as you know, test automated observability functions that are running across the mesh to make sure your mesh is not fragile and it's, you know, it's a healthy ecosystem. And people coming from kind of the, the embedded DevOps practices are very well familiar with, with this style of uh, maintaining integrity or maintaining the target state through automations. And this is just a fancy way of uh, saying that. So we look at the first, let's look at the first one. The way we structured this um, presentation, we looked at every principle and we looked at the intention of that principle and the objectives. And then we, we discussed a few fitness functions around those. However, even though we structured it this way, all of these principles are complementary and overlapping. So you will see the repeat of um, these objectives or intentions across those because they are all interdependent. That's why we have four of them and not one. I start with domain ownership. What does domain ownership mean? A quick refresher. Next slide, please. Um, at, 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 at the heart of it, uh, the idea of distributing data across domains is to address this one problem, the centralization, This remove the centralized bottleneck 
Uh, for decades, we have assumed that all of our analytical use cases, whether we are training machine learning models or whether you know, we're creating reports, we're looking at the data historically, we have to aggregate data into a warehouse and into a lake. Um, as Nigel was mentioning in, in the book he's reading, and the assumption was we must do that to have high quality data and high integrity. But this has been a bottleneck um, as the, you know, as number of use cases and the, uh, how we want to use data keep increasing. And as the number of the diversity of the domains where the data actually comes from uh, increases. So at heart, domain driven uh, ownership of the data address this, and that's what it looks like. Move to the next slide. It basically acknowledges that you have two planes of data. You have your operational plane where your microservices, your legacy systems, your applications are running, and they probably have the current state of the world data, data on the inside in their database that they're protecting through their APIs and the logic of the application. And you have the analytical domain, which now surfaces that data and that analytical temporal view uh, for that domain um, for the outside. So it's the data on the outside that we want to expose to the world within the organization or externally um, to demonstrate the, um, the data for that domain. So data mesh basically says, let's bring these two planes together. Uh, let's connect them together. It introduces a new concept data products, those hexagons that um, basically share the data on the outside, the ownership of data, whether it's operational, whether it's analytical, falls within the domain. So you have the alignments of these two aspects of the data um, <clears throat> across the domain um, and, and really tries to distribute this. And, and the reason DataMesh chose domain as a way of distributing and decoupling data is just because where we are in our evolution of our digital you know, transformation, the way we have built our digital businesses, we've built them around their capability of domains, you know, order management and sales team and marketing team and various functions, business functions. And around those, we build services and APIs and the data that they require, data they generate. So we're just piggybacking on that idea and say, well, let's extend that to the idea of um, you know, data, data ownership and exposing the data on the outside. So when you come to the objective, so OK, we, we did that. So we distributed the, the ownership. <clears throat> what are the objectives we're trying to achieve? So very first two that are really close to my heart and the most important ones is that we want to be able to scale out. We want to be scale out with elasticity as we get more domains onboarded, right? So, um, and we want to scale out the number of consumptions that we want. We don't want to have any centralized bottleneck in the middle. Uh, so we can measure, for example, the rate of, you know, um, rate of creating new data products or rate of retiring even data products. So the elasticity data constantly changes, right? So we can measure the elasticity, um, the rate of adoption of new products uh, and consumption of new data products. One other reason that we uh, align the analytical view and operational view is the truthfulness of the data. In the old model, by the time you ran your ETLs and you went through all of these hoops to kind of cleanse and model your data and present a beautiful analytical view of that data, business has moved on. The applications have changed. The source has evolved. So there is always that lag and either short or long in, in cases, even weeks or months, <clears throat> It takes that that we get that analytical view of the data. So by aligning those, we arrive at the truthfulness as in the data is as close to the source as possible, even for analytical use cases. So you can you can measure this again by running observability functions across your mesh and tapping into the operational endpoints like the APIs that let you see the current state of the customer and see on the other side, do I see the same similar cons uh, customer um, with, the, with the analytical view. Domain autonomy is a, is a big one there. We want these different domains to move fast, to generate and consume the data that they need without friction with other teams and with other domains. How quickly a domain can um, a data for a domain can be um, can be changed or it can be used independent. And finally, 
reduce accidental complexity. So the model that we had in the past, as in we composed the operational and analytical world with ETLs in between moving the data around has resulted in, in my opinion, in a ton of com accidental complexity. One change upstream has cascading effects downstream and it takes you hours to figure out what actually changed. The concept of the pipelines, the concept of the ETLs at core, really um, ignore some of the architectural principles, you know, abstraction of complexity and autonomy and all those, you know, um, good principles, solid principles. So hopefully by having this clear boundary of domains and clear responsibility, boundary of responsibility, we reduce that complexity and we reduce the change fail ratio as the data changes, whether upstream or downstream. And, uh, and that, that leads really nicely into, into data as a product. So as you saw, um, and we talked about the objectives and how we might measure them, uh, but we haven't gone down to the, the level of uh, a specific mathematical function as a fitness function. You know, We're leaving that as an exercise for the reader today. Um, and, 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 but you'll also see as we talk through data as a product, how some of these measures uh, overlap with the idea of uh, domain uh, aligned autonomy. And, uh, and the, the concept of, of data product is very, very close to this. While, as Jamak said, while microservices encapsulate their operational data, uh, data products look to put analytical data on the outside to, to deliberately expose it um, with the appropriate controls. Uh, and, and to achieve this, uh, the data product has to actually incorporate the data that it serves, uh, but also the code uh, to process it in a, in a resilient way uh, and, and the infrastructure that's required uh, to support that data product as well. And so when we, when we package these three things, data and code and infrastructure together in a way that we want to be able to support uh, autonomous domains, so changes in sales not to affect uh, changes in products or customer data, uh, so to be able to, to work with those different domains separately, for instance, uh, we're looking for data products to have the following properties. And, uh, and it, should be, it should be possible to discover data products uh, with a standard mechanism. Um, that we need to think about how consumers of data products can, can learn and understand about them and assess whether they're fit for purpose. Uh, we need to know that a data product uh, is, is addressable at a particular place uh, to be able to share it effectively and, and rely on its constancy in, in an architecture. Uh, we need to need to understand that the product is secure for the uh, for the requirements of that particular product, uh, and that it's interoperable in the uh, in when it's composed into a larger mesh uh, of data products. Uh, we need to establish uh, trust, and we'll talk a little bit more about what some of the dimensions of that might be in data products. And we need to ensure that these uh, these products are natively accessible, so that users can use the tools that they're comfortable with. Uh, in, in different business scenarios uh, to work with data products. So for instance, you know, we'd like to have a standard SQL interface for BI uh, and we might look to a, um, a flat file format or a richer representation for data science. And, and we're looking for this package to be, to represent value to consumers uh, in, in its own. And all of, these, all of these characteristics, we're looking to preserve these across um, increasing scale and, and change. And so this is where the fitness functions come in handy. So if we look at the objectives uh, for data as a product, uh, we can talk about product objectives, that the data is usable, uh, valuable, and feasible for customers. It must be so, uh, conceived as a product to, to serve those users' needs. And so we can look at that end-to-end, -end, we can ask that question, uh, does it serve users' needs with product measures? And then we can look at different stages of engagement uh, in terms of the ease of discovery, and we can look at search measures for that, uh, the ease of evaluation, and we can look at different dimensions of trust and how we might measure that, uh, the, the ease of quality evaluation, I should say. Uh, and then we can look at uh, how uh, consumers of data products can be confident and we can look at, look at service measures uh, as we've discussed in, in domain alignment. So when we think about data as a product serving users needs, uh, we're, we're thinking about how, how can we convert potential data product consumers into satisfied data product consumers? And we can actually think about that 
through a traditional product funnel. Um, and I've illustrated some representative steps here, but you might, uh, you might come up with your own funnel that makes sense in your organization. The key measures across a funnel like this um, are lead time to progress to a certain stage and conversion rate uh, as you move from one stage to the next. And so there will be, there'll be a bunch of leading indicators. You know, are, are, we doing, uh, are we doing the things that we should to make good data products? But ultimately it will be whether you're moving people to satisfy data product consumers as a lagging measure, which will indicate effectiveness. And uh, the, the lead time uh, we might note is not intended to be weeks or months here. Um, we're thinking in terms of minutes to hours would be, would be a great result to be able to move people through the funnel. So if we, uh, if we look at the, dive in a little bit into the ease of data discovery and looking at the, uh, at the early parts of the funnel, um, then we think in terms of search measures. Uh, do we understand what users are looking for? Uh, our, do we have coverage for those searches and can we provide relevant results for those searches? And also be really interested in what searches are misses. Uh, so what is the data that users are looking for uh, that we're not able to provide? And of course, what is the lead time uh, to move on from a search to doing something useful uh, with a relevant data set? And to understand if, uh, if, user, if consumers can do something useful with data, they, they'll want to be able to evaluate the quality uh, on multiple dimensions. And, and that looks like that's building trust in the data. Uh, and it involves having a conversation uh, with the data about uh, what, what it represents and uh, how recent it is and how often it's refreshed. And, and does that meet the, the cadence of business activities required? So if we need real time data, is, is this real time? Uh, how complete is it uh, and does it cover, uh, does it provide coverage? Uh, what transforms has it undergone? Uh, what, what might have happened to the data as a result of that? Uh, uh, what might have been lost in terms of richness in, in, uh, for aggregations or summary statistics? Um, but then also, what characteristics can we expect from this data? So what, what does it look like in terms of distribution? And, uh, and, and how does that help with decision making or insight or whatever other purpose we might use the data for? And so potential consumers are going to want to understand the expectations that a producer has of the data that they're producing. Uh, so they want those to be explicit. Uh, and they'll also want to be able to verify that what they're seeing matches those published expectations. And so this is the process of building trust. Does it, does it do what it says on the box? Uh, and does it do that reliably? And so we can, we can uh, measure uh, compliance with uh, the data product affordances that we discussed earlier. And we can uh, measure that against SLOs uh, for, for the dimensions that we've talked about. And we could add many more dimensions here that are, that are relevant in your instance. But ultimately, again, will be measured by um, progression of, of users from, from activation through to retention and, and continuing to use the data. And I guess uh, maybe there is one point here to for the audience that we assume that these, you know, being able to discover the data, the data describes itself, this is all intrinsic to a data product. You don't have a ton of tools around it to get these characteristics and provide this experience ancillary to the data product. The data product itself should be intrinsically um, satisfying these fitness functions probably without a ton of support from you know, ancillary tools around it. Of course, there's a platform. There was a comment earlier or the question from Martin. I mean, this, is this an our software architecture change or it's just the paradigm shift about operation and organization is absolutely an architecture change because even though we are not, this is not an architecture session, there would be, there's actually a coupon coming. I will do an architecture talk, but, uh, but you need that architectural enablement so that you can, uh, in, intrinsically and inherently in each data product convey uh, these sort of behaviors and characteristics that D D David's talking about and then be able to measure them, right? And, and verify them. And, uh, and this is again, part of the services that we imagine would be encapsulated with the data product uh, would be to build confidence in, in consumption of this product uh, once it's been assessed as, as fit for purpose. Uh, 
uh, and suitable for a particular use case. You know, we want to be able to build uh, long-lived services around that uh, as required. And so we'd look to, we'd look to service, service measures uh, to understand confidence in data consumption on an ongoing basis. So, you know, inspiration from the four key metrics for high-performing software teams and products. You know, we consider the change fail rate, which might be across uh, code changes in the data product, but also uh, incoming, the intrinsic incoming data uh, that, that the data product serves. And then, and then the mean time to recover. So these would be some key things. What, what level of service can I expect from my data product? Uh, but again, the, uh, and, and we, can, you know, we can look at whether we, on, on an activity basis, we're doing the right things to support that. Uh, but ultimately we'll be understand that we're successful if people continue to move uh, we, we get from retention of actually using the data product through to return from the organization we can demonstrate benefit from that use uh, through to referring uh, to other potential users if we take a, a product uh, mindset and the person responsible for driving that product mindset uh, we consider uh, a, key, a key measure is, uh, do you have a data product owner in place? You know, when all else fails and, and someone who uh, takes ownership and, and delight in uh, helping their customers move through the funnel, uh, do you have a data product owner that you can ask about the data in a peer-to-peer -peer manner uh, that requires no uh, interaction with a central team? So this is something that will, uh, while you know, we promote, uh, promote automation and self-service, uh, there's a point in building trust and quality uh, and, and understanding of data when talking to a person who understands it uh, makes sense as well. And so we think the data product owner role is, uh, is pretty key in supporting this model. David, I think you assumed the fitness function for happiness of your data product owner. This, this person seems super excited and <laughs> enthusiastic about her or his job because this is a long-term job. This is, this is, this is a long-term ownership of that domain uh, data products that they they need to take on. Yeah, yeah, and then who, who wouldn't be happy serving satisfied customers with, uh, with valuable data? All right, self-serve platforms, data platforms. So we've, we've had a lot of expectations, right? We talked about uh, distributing the data and, and data product, which is code and data as an autonomous unit of architecture with all of these characteristics and usability functionality that we expect. Uh, and that, that's a lot to ask. So let's go to the next slide. Self-serve data platform is, the idea of it is essentially building the, the, an ecosystem of tools that abstracts complexity. The main objective, the, the most simplest objective it has is abstract complexity for those domain teams so that they can build, maintain, or use other data products. And even though that I put a simplistic platform picture here with lollipops as an indication of automated interfaces for the, using this platform, this is an ecosystem of multiple planes and multiple you know, tools coming together. So if you go to the next slide, I just put an example of different planes. You will see at the bottom your utility plane, the planes that exist today, big data storage, uh, and so on, the, but we need to build upon that. We need to build upon that with what I call the data product experience plane, which is how can I easily with, um, you know, with declarative, simple declarative means, define a data product and have its life cycle managed for me, right? Build, test, deploy, change, observe the data, integrity of it. And then on top of that, how can we provide a set of capabilities that really gives that mesh experience of why we said every data product should be discoverable by itself and useful and meaningful by itself. But we know that those interesting analytical use cases happen when you converge and correlate data across different domains. So we need a set of capabilities now from our um, this ecosystem of our platforms uh, to give you that mesh experience, whether it's the emergence of, I don't know, knowledge graphs that you want to traverse or you want to have policies that you manage globally and you want to push automatically, whatever those mesh level capabilities are, we need a set of those as well. So um, if we go to the next slide, the underlying objective of these multi-plane data platform to start with is abstracting complexity. And the bottom line of abstracting complexity, measuring that is reduce cost, reduce effort, effort cost, right? 
how many number of data products do I data product developer need to, I need to have to maintain my ecosystem? What is the rate of successful deployment? Um, and essentially reducing the cost of data product lifecycle. I must say this actually this reducing cost comes with a caveat just because where we are in the evolution of this model. And that caveat is that even though we are expecting through automation and through abstracting, you know, the, the really bare metal complexity that the, our data engineers are exposed to today reduce the human cost in this process. I suspect, and this is just a, <laughs> I haven't measured this, I, I think you should be measuring this, the cost of infrastructure might go higher because just where we are today, um, our providers are, are not expecting us to use their resource or configure those resources in this sharded distributed way. And we might incur costs, uh, more costs. And then again, sorry, this is subjective. It's not objectively measured, but there might, it's something that you should be measuring. I would say the, the cost of your actual infrastructure as you implement this distributed model. The second objective is, Ultimately, we want to create this domain team autonomy, right? They can go and build, deploy, run these data products and observe them uh, with reduced lead, lead time with self-serve. I mean, self-serve should be actually a redundant word in the title of this, but I put it to emphasize that there shouldn't be any backlog dependencies. As a data product owner, I need to create a backlog on my platform team so that I can now go and, I don't know, put a scaffolding together for my, for, for my data product. Um, Again, uh, the way we need to measure the health of our platform is to, through a lens of ecosystem thinking. Um, I keep emphasizing that this is not one platform, so not one system. If somebody came and sold you a data mesh uh, platform, be suspicious of that. Uh, it's an ecosystem of tools, right, that allow you to um, discover data products or traverse the graph of your, your knowledge on this mesh. Uh, so you, and, and believe me, on day one, you will have very few capabilities in this platform. So over time, you need to be able to extend them. And one really nice way to build an ecosystem of tools is through protocols, through APIs. So standardize these interfaces to your platform. And that's what's something we do uh, so that you can make sure that people are using the platform through the platform APIs. Uh, the APIs can be extended over time. So really have that ecosystem thinking in mind. And I think that can be the health of that ecosystem of platform tools can be measured over time um, as well. How easily we can add new capabilities, how easily we can version, um, let's say the deployment capability of, of our platform. Uh, enable the emergence of mesh intelligence. So again, as a platform, whatever platform we're inheriting, buying, building, combination of all, we need to think about extensibility at the mesh level capability. So let's say today we, we build discoverability as a mesh level capability that can tap into every data product discoverability endpoint and get some information Mission and tomorrow we want to see the lineage and, and so on and so on. So um, the platform should allow adding things to, uh, to, 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 that, to the mesh level. And finally, automation. And that's easy to measure, right? How many, um, how many manual intervention is required for building and running this mesh and reducing those? And that should be something um, that's easy, easy to, uh, to measure and moving towards more and more automation. Uh, why we need federated computational governance? Well, again, it's one of those um, uh, titles with a lot of words in it, uh, but the, the, it, it essentially, <laughs> now that we have a distributed world, that's that every domain can do its own thing and move fast, they, they're gonna break, so break the mesh. So to get the mesh actually work as an ecosystem, uh, we need to have a governance model that is responsive and embracing the uh, this dynamic nature of the mesh, the distributed ownership of the mesh. Uh, so the federated competition governance essentially says we've got a set of policies that all of our data products need to adhere to. For example, we would use uh, a certain standard for describing the schema of our or semantic of our data products. Everybody must agree to that uh, to have a consistent experience of the mesh. 
But if you just say that, that's probably not going to happen. Why? Because as a data product owner, as David was saying in the previous slide, my incentives are, are around getting my data product out to the, to the users and the growth and happiness of those users. I don't really probably care about the rest of the data products. And this, this model tries to balance that, balance that global view over the local view. So it says there's a global set of global policies, but how can we actually practically make them enforceable? Well, we automate them. Okay, we automate them through the platform, but to, to, for those automations to be enforced or executed, they need to get embedded into the mesh. So going back to that architecture question, absolutely, like sidecars are a wonderful architectural style to have a policy execution engine embedded each of, in each of your data products. Uh, to inject access control, or in this particular case, like lineage metric collection, or whatever, whatever policies that we want to enforce. And so, and so that brings us to, to looking at those uh, federated computational governance objectives. And uh, uh, like any governance uh, initiate model, it's around, uh, it's around the common good, as Jamak said. You know, we want to support autonomy, but we also want to support the common good. And uh, when people talk about data governance, they're often talking in terms of security, integrity, and availability. Um, and so we'd say that those traditional governance concerns are definitely still in scope here. They're, they're not our focus uh, for, the, for the talk this morning, uh, except that we would expect to see security and integrity become decentralized concerns. And we would look at availability through the lens of a data product as well. And so uh, if we're looking at federated computational governance uh, and fitness functions and how we can use them to guide our, um, our evolution towards data mesh, we'd be looking at being able to measure decentralization. Um, and probably a simple way to do that is to have a scorecard that looks at what governance aspects are decentralized and to what extent. We'd be looking at uh, automation. Uh, so obviously with the complexity uh, of this model and the, the rate of change and scale, uh, automation is key uh, to be able to support the model. And so uh, looking at how well we're doing with automation, uh, we could look at coverage measures. And uh, interoperability of, of data products is, is key. So we'd be considering the compliance to the interoperability standards and, uh, and looking at different dimensions of that. But ultimately, uh, all of this is in support of, of building a richer mesh, a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts um, with measures of, uh, measures of connections and in increasing returns from the scale of the mesh. And so if we look a little bit deeper into what a decentralization scorecard might look like, uh, then we can, there's a, a great summary of this in the, in the article, uh, uh, Data Mesh Principles and Logical Architecture. And so we, uh, we look at governance concerns pre-data mesh, which might be uh, focus on a centralized team that's responsible for data quality after the fact for cleaning up, uh, for cleaning up quality issues that uh, are perpetuated by source systems. It's responsible for securing that data rather than providing the tools. Uh, and we'd look at a data mesh world um, where instead we have a, feder a federated team uh, and they're responsible for defining how to model qu quality and what constitutes quality. And they're responsible for defining aspects of security and ensuring that the tools are available. And we can look at across all the aspects that are relevant to your organization. We can customize this scorecard to different scenarios. And then we can, uh, we can make an assessment of uh, where we're at on the, the transition from a centralized world to a federated world of governance. And in, in particular, we're looking at what peer-to-peer -peer interactions we're enabling there. Uh, if we looked at how we might measure governance and, and give uh, indication that we're on the right, we're on the right path, we can have uh, we can look at the different aspects of governance and kind of like a test coverage report. We can provide a map of the degree of automation for governance aspects. We can look at which data products uh, are supporting that governance aspect, the automation of that governance aspect on an individual data product basis, and we can look at the level of support from the platform as well. And uh, so this might be multiple stages from uh, a fully, uh, fully manual assisted service through to a fully automated um, self-service platform capability. And so we, we, can, we can look at the aspect and we can look at the depth to which uh, governance is automated. 
Then we can also look at the compliance of data products through uh, a few different perspectives as well. We can measure the, uh, their adherence, individual data products adherence to, to mesh exchange standards. Uh, do, they, uh, do they use the standard APIs? Do they, uh, do they provide data in the forms that are expected um, with the guarantees that are expected by the mesh? Uh, do they implement the broader uh, data product affordances that, that make data products work together in a mesh? Uh, do they support change management protocols? So how can we get awareness of potentially breaking changes? Uh, how can consumers uh, uh, respond in, and, and how can in, in, a, in a federated uh, way to, to changes in a, in a particular data product that might be breaking the, the broader mesh. So how do we uh, decide on, on join keys, on backwards compatibilities, on, on questions like that that span multiple products and support change. Uh, and in line with the, the domain autonomy, Data products will define their own service level objectives for consumers to assess their, their quality and whether they're meeting uh, their quality uh, objectives. And so we can look at, uh, from, a, uh, from a mesh level, we can look at whether data products are, are meeting their own objectives. And all of this, we think, will be in support of a, of a richer mesh. And we can look at a couple of different dimensions of mesh richness as well. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the connections that are made across the mesh. So we're looking for more connections between data products as a, as a measure of richness and, and consumption scenarios. Um, we're also looking at the mesh as a whole preserves data product measures. So this thing can guide us. Uh, if, we, if we take a, a single data product, uh, we can look at its product measures and how well it's performing. But if we take a, a graph of data products as well, we should be able to see we should be guided by the same product measures as well. Uh, so we can, we can draw these boundaries at different scales in the mesh. Uh, and, and as we increase the scale and, and the product measures hold, you know, that's, that's an indication that we're preserving richness or indeed uh, increasing it as, as with each new data product introduced. Uh, from a mesh perspective, we should expect that this life cycle effort reduces so it becomes easier and easier to introduce new data products. Uh, and we should also expect to see the consumption of the rest of the mesh increasing uh, as we increase in, introduce new data products uh, in, in a rich mesh environment. And so these are, these are fitness functions that can tell us whether we're getting the anticipated network effects of bringing multiple data products together. So that's, uh, that's our journey across the, uh, the four main principles of data mesh, uh, the objectives uh, in support of those principles and, and the fitness functions that we think can help uh, guide you uh, as to whether you're meeting those objectives. We probably make a couple of comments about, about measurement and then open for, open for questions. And so as we've said, just, just talking about good measures, about measures is valuable. Looking at leading and lagging measures uh, is, uh, is important for fast feedback, but also measuring what matters. And we might pick a primary measure, but keep guardrails in mind as well. Uh, rates and ratios can be helpful over absolute figures. Uh, we know there's, uh, there's some warning signs if a measure becomes a target. Uh, and it may be, you may be tempted to baseline the old paradigm, but that, that might not always be productive because the basis of measurement might be different. It might be easier to start with a day one baseline than a day zero baseline. Uh, and the focus will change uh, uh, over, over the, uh, the course of the evolution. Well, you're on mute, is it Jermaine? The measures that we introduced uh, wasn't <laughs> meant to be exhaustive, that it's just a starting point, but, um, and, and it would change over time. Uh, you measure what matters when it matters. When you start building a data mesh and you're just this incubating the platform, incubating with a few domains, you're probably looking at different measures. Am I unlocking any value from my data? But maybe not necessarily at scale, right? Maybe not necessarily at in, initially at the speed that you expect. But once you have enough of your platform in place, once you have your governance in place, and you go into your scale phase and growth phase, then you're measuring your active participants and the rates of you know um, increased rates and acceleration of new teams new data products new use cases and if you get to that maturity and saturation of the mesh and i don't really think that given how we are moving given how much more new data we are generating new 
um, uh, ecosystems and alliances were for, forming, and now we're sharing data across those alliances. So I, I don't know what maturity is, uh, means, but maybe within a scope of an organization, at some point you re reach a maturity of that mesh, and that's when you're looking at, am I still giving and in getting innovation out of this mesh of data products? What's the cost of change? Have I created something fragile that one change might you know, bring, bring down the whole mesh down? So. Uh, the, the measures and your threshold, your accepted threshold would, would change over time. And that's something to think about because it's an evolution. And uh, Greg, I think we've, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. We do. And we are sitting in an unprecedented <laughs> circumstance, David and Jamak, where we have had the most number of questions ever at a by ThoughtWorks. So that proves it was an interesting topic. Jamark has done her level best. I've been watching. It's like a game of space invaders. She's been swatting away as many questions as she could beforehand. So if you're interested in some of those questions that were up, there's some great answers in the Q&A panel. And, and as always, we will come back to these afterwards in some of our follow-up material and uh, let you know. But I think one theme I can see running through them is a little bit of that. We get these at the by ThoughtWorks things because we, 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 we're in that kind of advanced state of thinking. How Getting it done, like Conway's Law. So Conway's Law was fantastic. It was about, you know, the org design results in an interesting parallel around system design. Data is clearly going to be that thing. So your experts on governance of data functional organizations that so many people live within because of just division of duties, those kind of things, product streams. I mean, is it really possible? Is it like, has, has anyone transformed their organization to be able to get the most out of a data mesh mindset? What, what case study can you give us, Jamak? Sure. We're at early days, so I don't have many case studies in my back pocket. <laughs> I have a couple, but I have to say, if you're on this call, you're in an innovator adopter, part of an innovation adoption curve, means you're going to take risk, the technology is not going to be there, and we're all learning together. I have to say there is huge enthusiasm, and we have definitely seen early signs of success. We have been at this for three years now. We have a client of you know, very large scale, very complex domains, healthcare in North America, um, on cloud, on and on cloud and on prem, uh, adopting a data mesh um, architecture, more from the technical side, less less the organizational side, and we've we've learned a ton. Uh, we definitely had um, you know fantastic success stories within that around that. Um, scale, elasticity, right? We, we went from one or two data products to now kind of hundreds of data products to create a longitudinal human record view of every customer, every patient, every member with this organization and creating new data products very quickly as new touch points get created. Like COVID happened, we had new touch points with, um, you know, chatbots and talking to the patients and we had you know, NLP products very quickly around those chatbots to provide um, new help. So we have that elasticity. We definitely have seen the elasticity. We definitely have seen how hard it is to build it and the gap that exists in the technology. There was a question there. My company is a skeptical. What would I do? This is a big transformation. And if your company is not a take at core, take risk in a way, wait a few years because, you know, that this may not be the right thing for you at this point in time. Um, so we have definitely seen early signs and what I'm uh, hopeful for is the amount of enthusiasm and innovation that is happening uh, by simply challenging the centralization mindset. Um, I, every week I talk to new innovators that are attacking the problem from a different aspect, from new startups. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. We're, we hopefully be on the right track, but we will make mistakes and we get some things wrong. And that's just the nature of, uh, you know, going into an unknown territory. And, and David, that central distributed authority empowerment's been, I think, across long careers has been the, the pendulum that we've all faced. So is there still a role for sort of like the mesh architect at the center of an organization's technology governance that is helping set those principles and standards and contracts for quality of data between domains. Yes, yeah, thanks, Nigel. And, and sorry, um, 
everyone. I'm not able to see the chat at the moment sharing my screen, um, but I do hope to be able to follow up afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that the, the um, there's, there's still a role for uh, some kind of central coordination, but the the mindset changes from uh, owning all of the all of the practices uh, and, and policies in teams to setting a framework that allows teams uh, to develop their own practices and policies in alignment um, with the with a, with a global model. Uh, and so, providing uh, providing the tools and, and frameworks to be able to advertise a data qualities product, for instance, rather than specifying upfront what, what quality means for every data product. Uh, so I think that that you know that that role for the central perspective remains uh, and you know that's probably why we've we've used the word federated rather than uh, totally distributed uh, that there is a, that there's a role for that coming together of different products but at the same time the focus it remains on enabling that autonomy in an aligned way in a safe way well look I think it's been a challenging day because complex concepts new, uh, been great to have two amazing people who are just deeply committed to this concept as being a better way of running our companies and and keeping us out of trouble in the next 10 years, I think is the main reason to consider what might what organizations might think is a very radical form of architectural governance for something around data. But I can tell you, if we are going to go to a world of machine learned intelligence where data from everybody who's on this call's systems and domains are being used to make life life decisions for people and i think that is that's a big goal that the, that the world has then we need to do that in an ordered and structured way so we commit on our behalf for, as a thank you for all the people who have turned up and asked amazing questions we'll get back to those in a follow-up um, thanks very much for participating in the chat uh, we do have a feedback form. We'd love you to have a crack at it. It's there in the chat. If you can click on that, it's always valuable for us to learn. And uh, I just want to thank Tharun for, again, technical support for these things. You all, you all know how challenging that can be sometimes. Thanks, Grace, for getting the audience along. Big audience for a topic of specialists to this. And Jamak and David, so, thanks so much for your time and thought and preparation for this. I know you're going to get a lot of follow-up inquiries. So... Uh, Good luck with those. And we'll see you at the next by ThoughtWorks sometime soon. Thank you so much, Nigel, for hosting us. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you all.